In this video, we're going to design and 3D print a GoPro handle using Fusion 360. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, we are going to make a handle, or essentially a selfie stick, but just one that you can hold in your hand without an extension, using Fusion 360. Now, I'm using this for snowboarding, just something where I can hold the camera in my hand very easily, and I don't have this huge three or four foot pole sticking out. So what I wanna do is I wanna start with this base piece, which I modeled to attach to the GoPro and then add something to it. So if you wanna follow along or if you wanna make your own, you can go to the description of the video and download this data set. And what we're gonna do is fairly simple, fairly straightforward, and something that we can tackle on pretty much any 3D printer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a new sketch. We're gonna pick the front plane, and we're gonna start by projecting the bottom edge or creating an intersection. Now, I'm gonna tackle this as if you're brand new to Fusion 360. So I'm gonna go through each step, even though it's gonna take a little bit longer. So make sure that you do understand the basics of Fusion 360, but I will walk through each step. So what we're gonna do is intersect with the bottom face here. That's gonna give us a reference for where we're gonna be sort of attaching. And then I'm gonna use my line tool, which is L on the keyboard, find the midpoint, which is that triangle, and start to drag down. Now, one thing we're gonna notice here as we do this is the midpoint of this body is not the midpoint of my coordinate system. And this is something that happens often whenever you're snapping to different uh, constraints on a design. So I'm gonna hit escape, L for my line tool, and this time I wanna make sure that I'm coming down from this point and as I move my cursor, you can see that it's actually moving to the midpoint or underneath the origin. So that's gonna be important that we do. Whenever we find a point on a design, we can get that extension from it without clicking anything. So I'm gonna go back to the origin and I'm gonna find the point where the origin hits this line and then draw a line straight down and say, okay. Now it's important to note, we're gonna hit escape. This is not constrained yet. Uh, we simply use that projection to help us locate it, but it's not constrained. So we wanna select that line, control or shift select the origin, and then select coincident. What that's gonna do is it's gonna allow us to extend that line out until it hits that point. Because this line is perpendicular, there's only one solution for that. We're snapped to that edge, we're perpendicular with that edge, and there's only one, uh, one specific solution in this case where we can make that coincident. Now, if it wasn't perpendicular and it was at an angle, it would be able to slide. And I'll show you that by selecting and deleting this. Now I can move this line around and it's always gonna point to that origin, but it does allow it to float around a bit. So again, we wanna make sure that we're perpendicular with this line so it's vertical. Next, I'm gonna use my dimension tool and figure out how big of a handle I want. Now in this case, what I'm gonna say is five inches. That's gonna be big enough that I can hold it in a glove or a mitten. And then we need to determine how wide it needs to be. Now, one cool thing that we can do in Fusion 360 is we can select this line and make it a center line, which will turn it into a construction line, but it's a special type of construction line. It'll still allow us to have a close profile for a revolve, but all the dimensions will automatically be diameter. So this can be pretty helpful, especially designing something like this. Now we're gonna start with a line. I'm gonna come out a little bit, and then I'm gonna draw a secondary line. Now, the reason that I wanna do this is because I don't want the bottom to be solid. I want to minimize how much time this takes to print. So this line right here, I'm gonna to convert to construction. It's only there as a visual reference. You actually don't need it. We could make this line coincident with this point and be fine, but sometimes having a visual reference can be nice. Then D on the keyboard for dimension, we're gonna go from that vertical center line to this point, and we wanna determine what the inside hole diameter is gonna be for the bottom of this grip. Now, I wanna make this about inch, inch and a quarter OD where I'm holding it. So I wanna make sure that the inside of this is going to be you know, some sort of minimal number. And then I'm gonna to come to the outside. There's gonna be a slight lip on the bottom of this. So I'm gonna make this 1.5 inches. Then we're gonna go back to our line tool. So escape to get off the dimension and L for my line tool. Then I wanna just build the in, start to build the inside, green check mark, start to build the outside, green check mark, and hit escape. Now I find it very helpful to start your designs like this, to start visualizing what it's going to look like. This inside piece, this is going to be 
the entire inside section. Now, we are talking about 3D printing, so we need to think about overhang angles and ways in which we can build the geometry without needing supports through the center of this. So what I'm gonna do as I get closer to the top is I'm gonna to start to taper this in to the center. So L for my line tool and taper it in, and then D for dimension, and I wanna give this a dimension. Now, in most cases, printers will handle 45 degrees, or uh, in my case, the printer I'm using will, will do up to 49 degrees. So you just need to understand what your printer's limitations are. So for example, if we say 90 degrees, it's gonna be perpendicular. Now, obviously we can't print that. Now, if we do 90 plus 49, this is going to give me the max angle that I can print. Uh, so again, make sure that you understand what your limitations are. So we'll go ahead and leave it at that for this one and we'll start to work on the outside. So again, the line tool, I'm gonna to come back and then we can start to come up. But at this point, I don't want it to just be a straight outside section. I wanna give it some shape, but I'm gonna use this vertical line as a reference. So I'm gonna find where that line wants to go and then escape and D to give it some dimensions. So this outside here, I'm gonna say 1.25 inch and a quarter. And then I'm gonna give this a height dimension of an eighth inch. And one of the reasons I want this lip on the bottom is it's gonna give me more area for the print to adhere to the bed. And this is gonna be important because we're printing something that's relatively tall, can easily get knocked or um, become delaminated from the print bed. So we wanna make sure that we give it the best chance possible. I don't like printing raft or extra material underneath that I have to clean off later. I like to have a, a sort of a clean base. So I might actually make this a little bit bigger, 1.75, just to give me a little bit more surface area. We could also make the inside a bit wider and arc it because we can print the inside as thick or as thin as we want. Just needs to be thick enough that we can sort of handle it. Then I'm gonna take this line, make it construction, which you can do with X on the keyboard. And I wanna give it some shape. This can be done with a spline or an arc or whatever you want. But I wanna basically go from this point to this point and then just give it a little bit of curvature, D to add a dimension, and I'll just say a 20 inch radius. It's just something that's close to what it was visually. Now at this stage, what I'm gonna do is finish the sketch, double click the mouse wheel to zoom back out, and create a revolve. Now you'll see here we had one closed profile automatically selected, it grabbed that center line, construction line as the revolution axis, I didn't have to do anything, and then I can join them together. Now, this is pretty much it, but we do wanna add a little bit more to it. Uh, so I'm gonna do a fillet, which is F on the keyboard. I'm gonna grab this upper edge and just round it off. And I'm gonna hit F again. Now you can add multiple fillets in the same fillet tool, which can be pretty helpful, but sometimes it's a little tricky if they tend to overlap each other. So like in this case, we're starting to get some overlap between the fillets and that typically produces a problem when you try to add them inside of the same feature. But what we can do is we can hit plus and we can add a fillet down here that will have no effect on it. I'm just add a nice rounded section there and say, okay. So that's pretty much it. And there's not really a whole lot to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And then I'm gonna send it to my 3D print utility. So for me, the, the way that I wanna do this is I'm gonna rename this body. I'm gonna call this uh, GoPro handle. And then I'm gonna right click on the body and save it as a mesh. Now in my case, I have the send a 3D print utility checked and I'm sending it to the Creality Slicer because that's the printer I'm using. I'm using an Ender 7. And this automatically will open up the Creality Slicer for us. Now, depending on what printer you're using and what slicer you're using, you may have a different process. You may save it out as a mesh and then take that mesh directly into your slicer program. You may also be doing this directly in Fusion 360, depending on the printer you have and if it's supported. Now, the printer that I'm using is supported in Fusion 360, but I'm gonna go ahead and do this through the Creality Slicer, as most people are probably doing it that way and um, saving it out into a uh, jump drive. So a couple of things here with the Creality Slicer, if you've used the Cura Slicer, it's very similar because it's based on that. Originally, the Creality printers just shipped with that slicer. 
and now it's a little bit modified, but there's not much that we really need to do. It comes in, it's pointing in the right direction. If we happen to have to rotate it, you can select it and you can use your options on the left-hand side to rotate it, to scale it, to, to do whatever you want. If you wanna print multiples of this, what you can do is just simply open a mesh file and add it to the build and you can print multiple pieces at the same time. For me, the main thing that I wanna focus on is I'm gonna add adhesion which adds a thin layer that's a little bit wider at the bottom and gives me a better chance of having this thing stick without getting knocked over. And it's not too bad to clean up. You can peel it off and use a razor blade to just clean up the corners. Support material, unfortunately, is going to be required. And on the inside, it doesn't need it because we made that angle to a point, so that's gonna be fine. But inside of the holes at the top, that's where the support material is going to be needed. So the overhang for the castle nut and inside of these holes. Now, what I've found the slicer to do is it creates this almost top to bottom key feature. And if you can break it loose, you can actually pull it out through all the holes very easily. Now, I've oversized this just slightly for the hole size and for the castle nut. Uh, when I made it the exact size as the GoPro mounts, uh, obviously it printed just a little bit smaller and removing that support material was a little bit trickier. So uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're just going to allow it to build the support material in just those red highlighted areas. Uh, so again, you can rotate this around. You can check your model and see if there's any support anywhere. It doesn't appear so, so this looks pretty good. Now also remember that I'm working with a specific overhang. Now I did... Uh, 90 plus 40, uh, 49, which is actually going to give me a little bit steeper angle than what I could print. I could have done uh, less than that, but we're going to just have this sort of safety margin when we're printing because honestly, the inside doesn't matter and it's going to give me a little bit more material up top here where it can potentially break off. The other thing that's important that I didn't mention when we were designing it is that I'm avoiding sharp corners. Now, these fillets aren't going to print great well, I mean, they might print okay depending on what resolution I use, but the main reason they're there is to give me more structure at the transition between edges. I don't want this thing to break, and the outside edges are the most important because the GoPro mount is going to go between those two, and then it's going to get sandwiched together. So I want to make sure that everything where that intersects the rest of the body is nice and smooth. I'm not going to use any fancy material. I'm just going to use a standard PLA because I don't know how this thing is going to work. PLA prints really nicely, and I know it doesn't really handle heat very well, uh, and it won't really handle the moisture very well. It's not going to last that long, but it's just to try out to see what design changes I might want to make. If this thing lasts a day, that's okay for me at this stage of the design. So once we have got it inside of the slicer, the next thing is going to be to pick our settings. Now, the default settings are pretty good here. The infill we can play around with. If you use gradual infill, it'll gradually increase it toward the top, which can be helpful if we are, uh, you know, we want more structure up top, but less at the bottom. But when we do that, we remove the ability to create the infill percentage. Now, what I'm going to do as a test is I'm going to say 100%, which you can see the icon kind of changes over here. I'm going to say 100%, and the highest quality will 0.12. I'm going to slice it and just see how long this thing is going to take to print. Now, I will note that the printer I'm using, the Ender 7, runs at 250 millimeters per second, which is relatively fast compared to just the, the average printer out there. And even that, it says 14 hours. So that's quite a long time. If I take the infill down to 10% and re-slice it, we're going from that 14 hours down to, let's see what it says here. So from 14 hours down to six hours, six hours, 17 minutes. And I found these times to be pretty accurate. So that is still a very long print. What can we do to change that? Well, we can reduce the quality. We can slice it now at the 0.28 profile instead of the 0.12. You can see it drops down to three hours or three hours, 48 minutes, almost four hours uh, down from six hours. Another thing that you can do is you can slice the design up into multiple pieces. We could break the handle up into a top and bottom with a feature that could snap together or glue together, whatever the case might be. And that would allow us to print these in different pieces if you're worried about trying or testing the overall design. You can also figure out how to attach just the top piece to something else. So in this case, I'm printing the entire handle, but it's not necessarily what I could do. I could print a small 
feature that has a cylindrical boss on it, and I could take one of my uh, mountain bike or motocross grips that are clamp on, and I could just use that grip instead of having to recreate the entire thing. For me, three hours and 48 minutes is, is gonna be okay. I'm gonna allow it to print that. But there's one more thing that we do wanna take a look at. I'm gonna go to custom. And there are a lot of custom settings, whether you're in the Cura slicer or in the Creality slicer or the Presa slicer. But the one thing that I wanna focus on, is so I'm gonna go down to the infill. Now the infill by default has a lines pattern, which is essentially gonna make a grid of lines. And then we also have things like the infill distance and the minimum areas. These values tend to change based on our settings, right? We're using a 10% infill setting, but we do have some options to change what type of infill we use. So depending on the design that you're using, if you're using something that's rectangular in nature, the lines work really well and you can print something that has very little infill on it based on your settings. But we could also change this up to do something such as a gyroid infill. Now, when we do that and we re-slice it, we're gonna go from whatever the time was with the lines, three hours and 48 minutes, I believe. You can see here it's three hours 45. So it's not much of a difference. It's actually a little bit shorter, but that's probably negligible in the overall uh, time. So you can see here in the info, we do have some estimation here. We've got the parameters for the infill, We've got the inner wall, the outer wall times, the overall times, and we can kind of see where those adjustments will really make uh, really make a difference. So you can see 15% of the time is based on the infill. So playing around with different infill options can actually help us out quite a bit. Now, if we do go back to the recommended settings, it will still keep that gyroid infill, uh, that, that setting in there. So if we go back, you can see it does still keep that. So if you do change any of those settings, keep in mind that it will remember that. And notice that we do have the option to reset. So cur currently we're in custom mode, but we could reset to some of those default settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this to removable. Remember, it's going to save it based on the name of the body in Fusion. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, CE7, Creality Ender 7, GoPro Handle, and that's what it saves on the jump drive, in this case, GoPro Handle.gcode. We're gonna eject that. Now, one thing I've noticed is if you pull the jump drive out too quickly with this, it will corrupt the SD card, unfortunately. So make sure that you just give it, you know, a couple seconds and when it when it disappears and it says it's okay to remove, I found that you need to just wait a little bit longer to make that happen. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and take this over to the printer, print it, and we're gonna see what this thing looks like. And there we go. So um, it did end up taking uh, roughly four hours to print and getting the supports out of the inside of it uh, where the thread or where the screw goes through was a little bit tricky. Uh, unfortunately, we, I was able to get some pliers in there and just rotate it and break it, but then I had to sort of just wiggle it to get it out, but it, it wasn't too bad, honestly. Uh, and you can see in this picture, I ended up leaving the support material in the bottom. Actually, it filled in the inside pretty well and then nothing sort of got packed up in the bottom. So I have used this a couple times. Obviously, it's just basically a grip to hold on to the camera, but uh, it does work pretty well. And hopefully you can take the supplied uh, GoPro end piece and kind of design your own mount system or your own pieces to use. Now, I will say that I ended up printing this in PLA. Uh, it wasn't sort of intended as a long-term solution. It was just sort of testing it out. Um, there are some inherent problems that I ran into. For example, the start and the end point around the print was probably not the greatest. Um, I have noticed that with this printer and the speed that it runs, it tends to have trouble when it has to start and stop like that. So some more work could be done there, potentially just changing the outside from being completely smooth to something that's a little bit more textured or working more on the inside or the internal features rather than printing a support, having it uh, print without support, but figuring out a way that I could manually sort of um, build those details. Uh, now, I did have the inside portion tapered as it was going up towards the top, so I wouldn't need supports in there, but it did still end up building those supports. And whatever slicer you're using, you can also use manual supports and decide which, which areas you want to have supports and which you don't. Uh, but in this case, I, I didn't end up doing that. But um, here's a, a little bit of clip that you can see in the bottom here of me just using this thing just out on the slopes. And uh, yeah, so overall, it worked pretty well.
Hopefully this gives you a good introduction into Fusion 360 and how to use it to design and build your own parts. If you have any questions, please let me know. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.